Thank you very much, you guys. Uh, I take it you can see my presentation. Um, so uh, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, present. Uh, my name is uh, Ryan. I've been with Transport Canada since 2008, and I uh, manage uh, the Navigation Protection Program, which administers uh, one of the pieces of legislation uh, that is very new within the government of Canada, and it's kind of meant to help to address this problem of uh, obviously an aging fleet, which is a challenge in Canada, but it's also a worldwide, a worldwide challenge as well. Uh, so this presentation is basically going to uh, go over a little bit about uh, the strategy and the status uh, that the government of Canada has taken to try and address uh, the abandoned and wrecked vessels uh, that are kind of plaguing coasts everywhere. Uh, and it's also uh, provide a little bit of an update uh, for you guys on uh, our, some new changes uh, to our pleasure, pleasure craft uh, licensing system. Uh, that's a tongue twister there. Um, and so uh, when the problem was really looked at, they, they identified kind of five key measures to really try and address this issue. Uh, it included the creation of uh, new legislation and uh, which is the Wrecked, Abandoned and Hazardous Vessels Act. And that legislation is really meant to address irresponsible, uh, irresponsible vessel owners to just put some more, more uh, like uh, lack of a better word, liability on the owner of a vessel to ensure that they are uh, uh, taking care of their vessels properly. Um, it also includes uh, a national inventory and risk assessment of all vessels of concern. Um, and you'll see in brackets uh, kind of who is the lead within the government of Canada for uh, administering and implementing each of these components. So Coast Guard is the, is the manager of the inventory and doing the initial risk assessments. Uh, obviously enhancing uh, vessel owner identification systems is a huge priority because you cannot hold owners accountable uh, without knowing who they are. Um, and uh, on top of that, there was uh, a short-term funding program uh, for the removal uh, of wrecks and abandoned vessels, as well as uh, money put aside for educating uh, vessel owners on how to be a responsible vessel owner and what the impacts uh, uh, these abandoned vessels are kind of having, as well as research into um, new uh, construction techniques, as well as possible ways to recycle or uh, mitigate some of the impacts uh, on the disposal side of vessels. And uh, the final component uh, of the strategy is to develop a longer term owner financed uh, vessel remediation fund, uh, similar to a, a few other jurisdictions. Uh, there was a, a, a large assessment done to develop different kinds of strategies uh, related to that. And so obviously the objectives of the the national strategy are really twofold. One is uh, prevent the occurrence of new problem vessels, uh, as well as uh, coming up with some techniques and strategies to address and remediate any all these problem vessels that are already existing. Um, within, within our kind of um, sector, uh, we class vessels generally uh, that are potentially causing problems. We use a term called vessel of concern. Uh, it may be posing all kinds of potential different issues. We don't necessarily know what it is. So we just say there's a concern of some sort related to this vessel. Um, so the first piece was the basically the creation of a brand new piece of legislation uh, called the Wrecked, Abandoned and Hazardous Vessels Act. Uh, and some of the key components of this uh, legislation was to strengthen vessel owner liability. So to really uh, outline uh, what are the responsibilities of the owner of a vessel. Uh, and to prohibit irresponsible vessel management. So basically to prohibit certain things that owners may do um, to kind of when their vessel gets to end of life. Uh, it enhances uh, the federal powers of the Canadian Coast Guard and Transport Canada to be a little bit more on the proactive side uh, versus the reactive side. So if there is a vessel that is on its way to becoming a bigger problem, uh, providing uh, the federal government some powers to take some mitigation measures earlier on so that we're not dealing with um, something that is very serious. Obviously, uh, to deal with a vessel that is secure and floating, but on its way to becoming uh, a wreck or uh, some other kind of incident uh, is much easier to deal with than after it is sunk and is, you know, spilling oil out of its fuel tanks everywhere. 
Uh, it also establishes a fairly robust uh, compliance and enforcement regime uh, as well. The legislation itself realigned some existing authorities. So it took, it, it kind of did a, a scan of different legislation uh, that kind of addresses vessel authorities and it kind of pulled them into a, a single one. So it took, it took some of the provisions out of the Canada Shipping Act and brought into, uh, it brought it into the Wrecked Abandoned and Hazard Vessels Act, uh, which we call WAVA. And um, it also took out some other components from uh, some other legislation just to keep all vessel related kind of uh, regulatory requirements into a, a single piece of legislation. And uh, the act came into force uh, July 30th, uh, 2019. And it's currently administered uh, by both Canada, uh, Trans uh, Coast Guard and Transport Canada. Uh, so what are some of the new prohibitions that were identified in, in this legislation? Uh, it basically, uh, there are six kind of new prohibitions related to irresponsible vessel ownership. Uh, five are, are enforced by Transport Canada and one is enforced by uh, the Canadian Coast Guard. So the first five in this list are administered by uh, officers under in my work unit. Uh, so it, it's now explicitly prohibited to just abandon your unwanted vessel. Um, while it, generally speaking, it was, you could, you know, you shouldn't be leaving something there. And there was kinds of other legislation that touched on just, you know, abandoning your property places. Uh, but this specifically speaks to just leaving a vessel somewhere. Um, and so that is now an abandoned activity. Uh, it's also uh, uh, prohibited to cause your vessel to become a wreck uh, by failing to maintain it. So uh, through negligence, if you allow your vessel to slowly uh, sink, uh, that is now a prohibited activity. Uh, as well, it's also prohibited to sink, strand, or ground your vessel on purpose. And there's some provisions in there, uh, you know, uh, if it's an emergency or other kinds of components, uh, it's not necessarily a violation of the prohibition, but uh, in general, it's, it's prohibited to intentionally uh, sink or strand your vessel. Also, uh, without being authorized, you cannot leave uh, a dilapidated vessel or a vessel in poor condition uh, just in one area for more than uh, 60 consecutive days. Uh, so if uh, lots of times uh, people will just go and put their vessel on the hook and it slowly is rotting. Uh, but if, if it gets to a certain state uh, and it's still there and it's, and it's not kind of being actively used or navigated, uh, that is now a prohibition where we can now direct that owner to take some measures related to the condition of their vessel. Um, and the last prohibition that Transport Canada um, enforces is the prohibition to leave your vessel adrift for more than 48 hours without taking some measures to secure it. Uh, obviously any responsible boat owner is not going to let their vessel just bob around out there with no one on board for more than 48 hours. Uh, and uh, this period is just giving an owner a reasonable time to take some, some measure before they're actually in violation of anything. And then the final, uh, the final prohibition in the act is it's prohibited to allow your vessel to become a hazard. And a hazard in the act is defined is, is very broadly defined. Uh, so it can be a, a hazard to a local community, a potential hazard to the environment. It could be a danger to infrastructure. Um, so the definition of hazard is, is very broad and, and uh, the inspection powers of uh, the Canada Canadian Coast Guard VOC officers uh, is, is also quite broad in order for them to be able to assess a vessel to determine the, its level of hazard. And obviously with all of these prohibitions uh, uh, to encourage compliance, uh, there are penalties and penalties for non-compliance uh, are both uh, can be either monetary or uh, criminal. Uh, so the maximum violation for penalties range between five and $50,000 for individuals and 25 to $250,000 for companies or corporations. Um, in, if it is a much more serious offense, uh, conviction through uh, criminal activities can also be done by way of prosecution with maximum fines up to $6 million uh, and can include prison terms. So obviously uh, you guys all know this, but uh, uh, part of this presentation is, is for general public, but how do you uh, be a responsible boat owner? Obviously uh, keep your vessel in good condition. So regularly maintain it, uh, check on your vessel uh, regularly. Uh, also, uh, plan ahead. Think about what what you're going to do with your vessel uh, once you no longer no no longer want it. 
Uh, and when your vessel reaches the end of life, uh, it's your responsibility to, to recycle or dispose of it legally and responsibly. Um, one of the also new provisions in the Act is uh, a new uh, insurance or security requirement uh, for vessels over 300 gross tons. Uh, so any vessel over 300 gross tons that operates in Canadian waters, uh, regardless of uh, flag, uh, country of flag, uh, is required to have uh, wreck removal insurance in the event of a maritime casualty. Um, and if you own or operate a vessel that is involved in a maritime casualty or incident, you must uh, report, locate, mark, and uh, if necessary, remediate any hazards that that wreck is causing. Uh, so that is a new kind of provision under WEVA. And you also must, uh, to be a responsible boat owner, our number one thing that we always tell everyone is please ensure that your vessel is licensed or registered properly. Uh, and if you sell your vessel, please make sure that the new owner also uh, transfers the ownership documentation properly. Because if your name is still on the vessel and something, uh, the new owner uh, becomes in violation of one of the prohibitions, uh, we may be uh, looking to you uh, for uh, taking care of the vessel that's still in your name. So uh, what what do we think that people should be doing uh, once their vessel kind of reach, reaches uh, end of life, uh, obviously recycling, um, you know, uh, depending on the, what it's made of and all of the various components, uh, you know, recycling is an option for some of the, some of the parts, uh, a lot of vessels, uh, you know, within our program, we do the disposal of a lot of vessels uh, and most of them, you know, the majority of it ends up uh, on the landfill side. Uh, we deal, you know, the, the, Biggest problem vessels are pleasure craft, so smaller type vessels. But um, uh, yeah, so most of them end up in uh, in landfills or other some sort of landside waste disposal. Uh, you can sell your vessel if it still has uh, some use or purpose. Obviously, you can trade it, uh, donate it, or uh, dispose of it. Uh, so what has Transport Canada done to kind of uh, address end of life management and the various kinds of challenges? Uh, obviously, we've uh, Transport Canada has done some studies to, uh, to look into uh, why are people or boat owners uh, just leaving their vessels behind? Uh, so what are the challenges uh, with having owners dispose of their vessels? Uh, and a national study was done to really look into uh, Canada's capacity and what the barriers are currently in place regarding uh, the dismantling, recycling, and disposal of vessels, and uh, trying to identify waste management options for the recycling and disposal of vessels uh, in the future. Uh, funding was provided uh, under the Abandoned Boat Program uh, for research into vessel recycling options and also into uh, vessel design. So for vessel manufacturers on how to build a vessel that once it reaches end of life is easier to uh, dismantle and uses uh, kind of a greener construction system so that at the end, uh, at end of life, it's, it's easier to uh, recycle and have less to divert, divert waste out of the waste management side of things. Um, so the second pillar or the third pillar, depending on where we're at in, in the bullets is uh, obviously we need to know uh, what the issue is and, and have some sort of assessment uh, process in place. Uh, to prioritize. So uh, as you mentioned, there was some 14 million vessels. Um, the next couple slides will have some numbers for some data in Canada, uh, but uh, where the, there was a creation of a national inventory of problem vessels or vessels of concern. And uh, this is managed and overseen by the Canadian Coast Guard. And the primary purpose of this is to get a handle on the scale and the scope of, of the problems in Canada and to track and report cases, including uh, enforcement actions that we have under WEVA. Uh, so Coast Guard has been engaging with partners and stakeholders to validate. Uh, we get a lot of reports from the public or outside and, and everything needs to be looked at and verified. Uh, and obviously Coast Guard is responsible for that. Uh, once a vessel makes it into the inventory or is reported, uh, it, is, it, it is run through a risk assessment methodology uh, developed by Coast Guard. Uh, it's still uh, in the works. Uh, of being finalized, um, but every vessel gets assessed, ranked, and uh, prioritized uh, to help us come up with a strategy on uh, where to focus our efforts. 
uh, obviously there's lots of vessels out there. How do we know which, which ones do we clean up? Which ones do we leave uh, for a later date? Uh, and this is all a part of it. Uh, so this slide here just shows some of the, some of the breakdowns. This data isn't totally current. It's uh, as of uh, kind of early 2020. Um, and these are vessels that have been uh, reported uh, through various reporting parties. It hasn't uh, done a deep dive into our pleasure craft licensing system or our vessel registry. Um, but there are about 1500 vessels uh, in Canada as of this time. Uh, I think the most recent number is up around 2000. <clears throat> I know just in our region, so in, in BC, so I, I'm on the west coast of Canada, uh, we receive about three to five uh, reports of new vessels into the inventory every week. So uh, we're growing at 200, 200 plus vessels per year just in our region. Um, and the vast majority of vessels happen to be in on the West Coast. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with uh, weather conditions out here. Um, the majority of the vessels that are in the system right now do not have known owners. Uh, and typically this is uh, in, in part that the vessels are old and have passed hands uh, many times. And uh, each time it passes hands, uh, and we'll get into this a little bit about enhancing owner identification, uh, but uh, the new owners are not properly licensing or registering their vessels, and we just uh, the vessel ownership history uh, gets lost. Uh, in terms of the types of vessels that are in the inventory, uh, about half uh, ha of the known ones, half are recreational, uh, a quarter are commercial, and the remaining have no known vessel category. They're either so broken up that we can't really classify them or we just don't know. Uh, and in terms of vessel age, um, right now, uh, mo the majority, we don't have uh, a good history of the actual age of the vessels. Uh, but from experience, uh, the majority are kind of over the 35 plus years old. Um, uh, I know I, we saw a study in our, just in the Canadian registry, I think over 60% of all the vessels in the Canadian registry are over 35 years old. Uh, so once uh, it gets into the inventory, uh, obviously it's going to get assessed uh, to prioritize, you know, what are the potential impacts? So it's looked at from two, uh, it's a pretty standard risk, mat risk matrix for those of you that know, obviously there's the impact factor. So uh, what is the potential actual impact should something happens? And we multiply that by the probability factor. Uh, so how likely uh, that is to, has, uh, to occur. Uh, so when we look at the different types of risk, uh, this is kind of the hazardous component. So it looks at the potential risks to the environment, the economy, uh, public safety, and social, social, uh, social, cultural, or indigenous potential impacts. And that obviously is multiplied by the likelihood uh, so, you know, where the current situation of the vessel, the state of the vessel, the environment that it's in, uh, what is on board that vessel and how much is known about that information. And once that is all done, uh, it gets into a, a finalized risk score. And uh, the next table kind of identifies what happens. So usually what happens is a vessel report comes in and just based upon that information that's received, it's usually some photos, some information about the location. Uh, an initial kind of high level assessment is done, but that, that initial reporting phase and initial risk assessment uh, really feeds into what happens next. Uh, so depending on what the criteria is, uh, we, it, get, it can get into a much more uh, technical risk assessment or comprehensive risk assessment. And once we get into uh, kind of stage three and four, uh, this is often the time where uh, a, a marine surveyor would be hired to get uh, more technical data and a more technical assessment of the vessel to really uh, clarify what the risks are. Uh, and to oftentimes if uh, risk management activities are going to be undertaken uh, to develop some strategies on how to best mitigate the potential impacts. Um, and vessels will often get assessed uh, and uh, depending on the outcome, uh, you know, there may be no further action, but that doesn't mean there won't be further action at a later date, but just based on the current state of the vessel, uh, the risk is at a state where it's stable or um, uh, it, there's just, uh, we're not going to be taking action at this time, uh, but should situations change, uh, there may be action taken at a later date. Uh, the fourth pillar uh, related to 
uh, kind of addressing uh, the issue related to abandoned vessels is kind of addressing uh, existing what we call legacy vessels. Uh, so uh, close over $5 million was set aside for the government for uh, community groups, uh, local governments, uh, or Indigenous groups to uh, have a grant and contribution funding program where they could clean up old abandoned and wrecked vessels uh, that are having a kind of an impact uh, on their communities, but haven't hit the threshold where uh, either Transport Canada or Coast Guard is going to be taking measures themselves to address to address the vessels. So these would kind of be the low risk, low impact vessels that have been assessed. Um, and so uh, we're in the final year of the program right now, and it's been uh, fully fully prescribed. And through the program, uh, I think over 200 vessels have been uh, identified for removal or have been removed. Uh, there's also $750,000 that was um, uh, funded for five projects related to education and awareness for vessel ownership. Uh, and uh, three projects were funded looking at studying uh, the recycling for recycling and design uh, of vessels uh, for end of life components. And the final phase is uh, a long term uh, owner funded vessel remediation fund. Uh, a lot of different uh, avenues were looked at on how to uh, have this fund uh, financed by vessel owners. Um, and basically the fund would be set aside and it would be specific to only, uh, it would, could only be used for the remediation of wrecked or abandoned vessels uh, where an owner is unknown or cannot be located uh, or is unable to pay. And this is uh, very similar to uh, the ship source oil pollution fund, which in, uh, in Canada, which was a, a small surcharge that a lot of companies paid into uh, that is used for uh, oil response activities. It, it funds and it's set aside specifically for oil, oil uh, response, but this would be specifically for uh, the removal of wrecked, abandoned and hazardous vessels. Uh, it's uh, Washington state runs a similar type of uh, program where there's a small surcharge on uh, the pleasure craft licensing fee. Uh, and this fund is set aside uh, and is only to be used for uh, the recycling of vessels. Um, right now, uh, it looks like the most likely uh, fee will be a small surcharge on the pleasure craft license, uh, but other funding options are still being explored. And the last kind of pillar uh, uh, is enhancing vessel owner identification. As I mentioned before, uh, if we don't know who the owner is, it's very hard to hold them accountable. Um, and so uh, the next few slides are going to talk about some of the changes to the small vessel regulations uh, related to uh, the change to the pleasure craft licensing system. Uh, Transport Canada is responsible for developing and maintaining the regulation centers and policies related to uh, recreational boating and licensing. And uh, obviously pleasure craft licenses are used to help identify owners and ple uh, pleasure craft license holders. Uh, it's used by search and rescue and police to help uh, in emergency situations and it will support uh, accountability and compliance with environmental regulations. And uh, in addition to the pleasure craft license, obviously there's the Canadian registrar uh, registry of vessels. Uh, so what are some of the highlights of the new changes? Uh, so currently license, uh, pleasure craft licenses are either uh, lifetime or valid for 10 years. Uh, under the new uh, licensing system, it will be a five-year renewal period. Uh, there was lots of debate uh, on the length of this licensing period. Uh, and it looks like uh, based on stakeholder consultation, uh, five years uh, was uh, determined to be the most appropriate. Uh, balance between um, the kind of, for lack of a better word, the hassle of having to relicense your vessel all the time and keeping information in the system up to date. Um, so currently a pleasure craft license is only required for vessels with an uh, engine over 10 horsepower. So it basically excludes any uh, sailboat without an engine or with a 9.9 kicker or a small inboard diesel. Um, uh, and based on our experience, uh, a lot of the vessels that we deal with are uh, sailboats uh, that have kind of reached end of life. Uh, so what will, what will the new pleasure craft license, uh, it, will, it will be independent of an engine, but if a vessel has an engine over 10 horse, it definitely requires it. Uh, but it also, any vessel over six meters in length um, 
regardless of engine or not, uh, will require uh, to have a pleasure craft license uh, with the exclusion of human powered only vessels. Uh, so canoes, kayaks, uh, outrigger canoes that might be over six meters. Uh, if it's a human powered craft, uh, a pleasure craft license is not required. But if it is a sailboat over six meters, uh, regardless of whether it has an engine or not, uh, a pleasure craft license will be required. And obviously this is to just uh, provide a more comprehensive data set for pleasure craft license and uh, knowing who owns uh, what out there. Uh, so what else is uh, going to change? Obviously uh, fees is a big part of this. So currently the pleasure craft license system uh, is a cost is a zero cost. Uh, you can register your vessel for free. Uh, and the new proposed change will be a $15 uh, service fee. So $15 every five years, uh, which is, you know, in my mind, very cheap, very reasonable, $3 per year uh, for acquiring a new PCL, renewing a PCL or transferring uh, a PCL. Uh, and that $15 fee every five years will basically cover the operation to run the program, which is about $2 million for Transport Canada. And um, Getting back to uh, the service charge uh, for uh, vessel recycling, right now it's looking, uh, we're proposing about a $15 fee all, uh, every five years uh, that would be added on to the pleasure craft license. So the total would be $30 every five years <coughs> to help uh, fund the program. So uh, the, final, the final cost um, and implementation, uh, it's still in the development phase. Uh, I think they're, they're hopeful to have uh, these things in place uh, sometime in either late 2021 or into 2022. And uh, this last slide here is um, what to do if uh, you see a vessel of concern, uh, who do you call? Uh, so here's the various kinds of uh, situations. Uh, but uh, the Canadian Coast Guard operates a 24 uh, hour a day, seven day a week um, uh, emergency line where anyone can call and report their vessel to get it onto the inventory for assessment. And uh, if uh, across Canada, there's three centers, uh, all of the phone numbers are there. And uh, again, uh, thank you guys uh, very much. Uh, my name is uh, Ryan Greville. And if you have uh, any questions or concerns, uh, you are now able to ask. Ryan, it's Mike in the UK. I'm ever so sorry. I, I kicked off by introducing you correctly and then read out Sean's bio. <laughs> my, <laughs> it's okay. My it's, apologies. it's no problem. I introduced myself. <laughs> no, it's good. It's good. <laughs> uh fascinating presentation um we have a question i think from hatem come and join the uh, conversation hatem need to unmute your microphone hatem hello hi yeah you hear me now right yeah good yes yeah okay great so i have a quick question um, concerning the uh, the vessels registration, so basically Transport Canada they treat the small dinghy on the same treatment like um, an eighty meters uh, vessel uh, X X um, let's say for example X commercial vessel used as a personal craft they are complying with with mostly the same requirement uh, in terms of 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 the uh, license or registration and the, um, the way the Transport Canada is inspecting the vessels. So do you have any answer for this? Yeah, so um, I, I think the, the light, it, it's really tough, you know, and, and honestly, as a, as a government regulator, it's a, a little bit frustrating. Um, as we, de you know, our program, we've faced a brunt of all of the complaints of the various, of the various people. And, and yeah, once it, once it moves out of the, the commercial regime, which is highly regulated and uh, our, our marine safety inspectors are out doing inspections and there's certification, all kinds of requirements. Uh, once a vessel goes into the pleasure, pleasure uh, on the pleasure craft side, uh, the requirements are significantly lower. And I believe uh, up to uh, 
five, there's, there's different kind of tiers. There's five ton and uh, I'm, I, unfortunately, I'm not an expert on on this side uh, on the small vessel reg on the small vessel registry or pleasure craft licensing side. Uh, I'm not an expert, uh, but there definitely are different requirements on the licensing side. It's exactly the same. You need to have you know all of your information, uh, uh, but on the certification size, there might be some components. Again, I'm not an expert. If if you do have some information or if you want some additional information. Uh, if you can reach out and contact me, I can put you into um, contact with our Office of Boating Safety, who uh, do all of the oversight of uh, the pleasure craft side of things. So the, the, the reason I'm asking this is I, I do a lot of ex-Coast Guard boats, and like some, some guys, they bought them, and they use them as, as a personal craft. And yep. like during the survey, I, I usually spend like two days doing the survey on, on, a, on a 390 plus tonnage vessel. So um, uh, when when I start to compare the vessel with the commercial ve small commercial vessel like standards, the owner starts to tell me, no, it's not complying. It's I'm I'm not supposed to do this. I'm not supposed to do that. And you find like maybe six seven entries of oil in the in the in the uh, in the engine space, and um, and um, uh, in the engine bilge, I mean, and he's not interested to 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 flush it out or clean it because. The, the excuse for everybody is it's just a personal craft. So yeah, yeah I think I think that's that's a thing that Transport Canada needs to to um, to, to have a look on it. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a very good comment. So um, I guess uh, not that it's super helpful, but if uh, if that oil uh, gets discharged either by sinking their vessel or some some other kind of component happens. Um, where they, through some sort of uh, owner failing to maintain it, uh, the new legislation does uh, allow some, I guess, uh, compliance measures to be in place. Uh, or if, if there is kind of loose oil in a pleasure craft, and that can be uh, when it, if it gets reported to us, like they're not really maintaining the vessel and it goes through our system and, and through our hazard assessment, uh, it's determined that it is highly likely that this is uh, something very bad could happen. Uh, Coast Guard at that time could um, issue directions to uh, mitigate that potential hazard. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just an example, you know, like... like yeah, oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. Uh, the pleasure, the, the, I would say within Canada, the, once you get into the pleasure craft side, it's highly unregulated, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, Ryan, I've been asked by somebody, can we have your contact information, please? How do the people get in touch with you? Uh, I will, uh, you can uh, see, uh, so my name is up here. Uh, if you go to uh, the bottom line here, uh, the navigation protection program, that's the phone number. And I will put in the chat, oh, uh, I, let's see. I will put in the chat my email address. Fantastic, that's great. So whilst you're doing that, uh, Sarah, I can see you've got your hand raised and, um, Said as well. Sarah, do you want to unmute and come in? Oh, hi, thanks for that. Ryan, thank you. That was uh, that was uh, fantastic. Um, I, I have a couple of, oh, well, I have one question specifically for you. How can the public find out how to deal with their end of life vessels, costs associated with it? Um, yes. So yeah. I, I did send, uh, Sarah, I did send you a bunch of information. Uh, we have some brochures. But uh, in terms of the general public, and I think one of the challenges um, is it is expensive uh, to, to deal with a vessel. It's not as simple as, you know, if you have an old car, uh, you phone up a wrecker and someone will probably come and pick it up for free for you. Um, uh, typically, you're not getting that same kind of service with, with a vessel. Uh, and, and the other challenge is, is it really depends on where you are. I know in Vancouver area, there are some landfills where you can bring your sailboat uh, on a trailer and just drop it off. You pay by the foot. Um, and, but there are other areas where that is not, not happening uh, or you're not able to do that. So it, it's very contingent. Uh, and one of the studies that was being done was looking at you know what to do. So many people are they may want to be responsible, but they, it's, it's really challenging for them. Uh, I know as a program, uh, you know, we, we've been personally, my program, 
we've been kind of disposing of 50 to 100 vessels per year. And depending on where they are in the condition, you know, our typical cost for doing disposal, so taking it from the water all the way to end of life is three to $10,000, depending on size and, and where it is. And that is, you know, cheap. Um, we have uh, developed some really good relationships with some, uh, some uh, marine operators. Uh, whereas, you know, if you have to get a barge and crane to get stuff out, you know, you're looking into uh, tens of thousands of dollars to, to, to get a vessel uh, out there. So I, I don't have like a nice list of, oh, if you have a vessel, take it here. Uh, but I did send you some brochures uh, related to what, what you can do. Uh, I can look and see if we have any more, but I can, I can fire those off to you as well, Sarah. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. And I'll share those with, uh, with, the, with the other members. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, Saeed, you have your hand raised and then Jason. I'm unmuting myself. Uh, is anyone here? Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Uh, okay, excellent. Thank you so much, Ryan. And I'm joining all my colleagues to its wonderful presentation and a good uh, eye opening. And uh, for me, uh, the Canada just signed the Nairobi Convention, which is the on the WAG, you know, it only two years ago, and yeah. uh, it was in place since 2007. Uh, it's very clearly for big boats, you know, when they come, they have already a wreck certificate and this kind of thing. It's very defined, but maybe it's the big issue for the smaller one that, uh, and I was wondering how can we, uh, IIMS Canada, uh, help you in the, uh, or contribute with Transport Canada or the Canadian Coast Guard. Now I heard that you have sent some pamphlets to Sarah, which I'm sure she will share it with us. Is there anything that you want to take advantage for all this professional around and uh, yeah so you know where where i see uh the crossover is once we get into um once we get into when you looked at when we're doing our risk assessments getting into the more technical and comprehensive uh, obviously uh we have a certain level of expertise but once we get into the much more uh much more technical or detailed assessments of risks or potential uh, you know, you know, I can look at a vessel and be like, yeah, that that is definitely dilapidated or in poor shape. Uh, you know, there's eye test ones, and then there's ones that uh, are dilapidated, but uh, you know, it, I'm not, I don't feel confident in my ability where we would uh, really want to be engaging uh, marine surveyors to to really, for lack of a better word, build our case to help us frame our decision making uh, in what next steps uh, are going to happen. And uh, I know we've, we've kind, of, kind of started to do that. Uh, and for those of you that aren't aware, there is, a, or, or there was just recently a, uh, uh, on government, government of Canada, uh, a request for, uh, a request for not, not proposals, but to get a specific arrangement made uh, where we could hire, you know, to get into the government contracting system for hiring marine surveyors. Um, I, I believe it's still open because it could be applied to at any time, but uh, in, in, that's typically where our programs would get involved, where uh, we've done our initial assessment and we feel that we either uh, don't have enough information to be able to make a decision, but we feel that it, it does pose a risk, but we need um, uh, a more comprehensive, uh, I guess, a more comprehensive assessment uh, versus what our staff can provide. Um, and uh, we're really, uh, the program itself has only been in place since uh, July 30th of 2019. So we're coming up on the two year anniversary. Uh, and, you know, you know, government, it takes a long time for our programs to kind of get a good flow of, of things going on. Uh, so in the past kind of two years, we've really been uh, tackling uh, what we like to call the low hanging fruit, things that are very obvious, you know, things that are already sunk or have huge holes in the halls, all that kind of stuff. But as we kind of, for lack of a better word, run out of the nice, easy ones, uh, I definitely see us having to engage with, uh, uh, with marine surveyors uh, much, more, much more closely. Okay. Excellent, excellent, Ryan. Happy to hear a beautiful answer. We look forward to work with you and yes. anything that uh, IIMS Canada can contribute with Transport Canada or the Canadian Coast Guard who will be more than pleased. I mean, you have hundreds of years of experience of married surveyors and uh, 
like uh, ourselves, you know, since 2007, we're dealing with the Nairobi Convention. So we will be yeah. pleased to contribute. Yeah, thank it, you. yeah, no worries. My pleasure. Okay, thanks, Mike. Uh, Jason, do you want to unmute your microphone and join the, con the conversation? Yep, here I am. Can you hear me? Yeah, sure. Yes. Excellent. Good. Uh, yeah, once again, Ryan, great presentation. Uh, this is something that I've seen uh, in the interior of BC that it's becoming an exponential problem um, of, you know, abandoned boats and all that sort of stuff. Um, my question sort of revolves around like the, ident the owner identification. Um, sort of what I'm seeing every time I do a survey or whatever, trying to find, you know, people have bought the boat, they've got the registry number on, on the front of the boat and they think that's it, that's fine, happy days. Um, you know, connecting the owners with the hull numbers and all that sort of stuff. How is that sort of, you know, that, that identification thing and getting the owners to, when they purchase a boat, get onto the vessel, either vessel registry and or what you sort of said is to sort of, you know, volunteer um, kind of like, in, how, how the, is TC uh, envisioning enforcing this? Um, yeah. Would it be uh, something, something, I mean, Something that, well, you know, what I find is the boat owners here won't, you know, registering their vessel or identifying their vessel as them as the owners is the tricky bit, but they'll make sure that they've got their fishing license or whatever. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a sort of catch-22 of uh, yeah. they follow half the regulations, but uh, don't really know about the rest of them. And yeah, 100, uh, what 100. I'm finding is I sort of have to educate everyone, all the boat owners, especially around here in Kootenay Lake that they just, they've got no idea about it and how it's sort of uh, yeah. getting out there. Yeah, 100% 100, 100 agree. Um, you know, fr from what I've heard anecdotally, of course, um, the reason they don't uh, license their vessel is they're avoiding paying tax. Uh, <laughs> so when they do that, when they transfer the license, uh, I don't know, it makes it way through the system and the good old province says, I need my PST for the sale of that vessel. Uh, and yeah. and uh, honestly, I think that's probably one of the number one reasons why it doesn't happen uh, outside of obviously the enforcement side. Uh, so right now, uh, enforcement uh, of vessel licensing is done by uh, local law enforcement. So mm -hmm. RCMP for most of Canada. Um, that hasn't uh, really changed. And uh, RCMP are not super interested uh, in going and checking licenses, kind of a, you know, uh, that's low on their priority list. Uh, so uh, Transport Canada is looking at expanding, uh, you know, who can um, check for vessel licenses. Uh, you know, if that is, you know, you, you've kind of hit it on the head right there. Oh, uh, a fish cop. Well, while you're, you know, the license is a contravention, uh, not having an up-to-date license is a contravention act ticket. So just like a speeding ticket um, or, or a fisheries violation ticket. So, you know, oh, I'll check your, I'll check your fishing license and I'll check your boating license. Uh, you know, that's a, a, a great way to kind of look at it. Uh, same thing with my officers. Uh, I have, uh, you know, we, we do a lot of other things, but we're out there. Uh, we're talking with people, um, about their vote, because you know, why am I talking to you? Well, someone called me about your vessel, and now I'm looking into it. But I can't, uh, you know, right now I'm not designated as an enforcement officer for checking licenses, so I can't ask them. Can you show me your license? And if they don't show it to me, I can't give them a ticket. Uh, you know, seems kind of silly. So uh, obviously, uh, we we understand the whole enhanced ownership component is is an is a giant issue. Um, and personally, uh, I'm on the, I'm on similar to you. I'm on the tail end. I'm dealing with it where I really want to find the owner so I can hold them accountable. And, you know, our success rate on the, on getting hits out of the pleasure craft license system, is like 95% failure rate where if we even get a name, uh, <laughs> it is uh, fourth, fifth, sixth owner, you know, I get a name. Oh no, I sold that boat back in 1998. And then who'd you sell to? Oh, we get a name and we number we and you know we we'll track it down as far as we can, but it's you know very rarely do we do we get it uh, on that side. So uh, we understand it's a huge issue, uh, and it's just going to take some time uh, to kind of yeah. 
get that get that in place for sure. Thank you, Jason. And sort of knowing the well, my location sort of you know, east and west Kootenays and out out here. Um, as Sarah said before, what can we do as surveyors and help TC out in, you know, I, I know, you know, the last time I saw a TC surveyor out here was quite some time ago and that was on a project that I was involved in. But um, yeah, I, you know, we're, we're in an area where it's wide and far and all that sort of stuff. But what I'm sort of seeing is, especially with a lot of the marinas around here, so it's hard to find spots in here. So all the marinas are demanding people have insurance and all the insurance companies are sort of coming back to us saying you need a survey for your, for your vessel. Yep. Every time I sort of do the registry search or whatever on the, on the number or the hull identification number or whatever, still don't find anything. Um, and is that something we can sort of, as with TC and surveyors and potentially insurance companies and what have you sort of blend together to, you know, have this sort of, you know, but where a marina says you need an insurance survey, where's they, where's the, where's the marina not sort of saying, well, uh, where's your um, identification license as well, or um, yeah. you know, your, your source of identification, you know, initially. Yeah, I, I mean, you could obviously encourage them, uh, provide them information, uh, you know, on top of uh, revamping the system and the regulatory requirements, uh, we are definitely, Transport Canada is trying to streamline the actual process to allow it to get done. Uh, by making, you know, being able to do it online, uh, do a bunch, uh, just to, to really make it easier to uh, license your vessel. Um, but obviously, yeah, you can't require it. Uh, I mean, you can, you can choose to be like, I'm not going to survey it unless uh, you update the license. Uh, but no, you know, you're not going to do that, right? <laughs> it's like, yeah, I'm not going to take your money. It, it, it's like, um, but I mean, you, you can try and educate them on the benefits of doing it. Uh, like, mm -hmm. honestly, we recover a lot of vessels, uh, like, you know, not well, a lot. We, we recover, you know, tens of vessels every year uh, yeah. that are totally have value that we can't return to the owner. We've, uh, we've taken every measure that we can possibly can to find the owner. Uh, and we can't because they haven't updated their information. Like, yeah. you know, uh, and, and we've been actually dealing with a little bit more on Kootenai Lake lately. Uh, uh, apparently, there's a giant influx of houseboats on the lake. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> we're getting all kinds of complaints in. and uh, all kinds of complaints and stuff about that. But, you know, uh, if you have your boat out on a buoy and or you just an anchor and, you know, a big blow comes through, you weren't quite ready for it. And it it drifts somewhere and someone phones us. I found this boat. And we try and get your property back. We can't because we can't even locate you. And we end up either if it's most of the stuff um, because we, we don't want to deal with it again, we end up disposing of it like in the garbage. We throw everything away, even if it's worth a few thousand dollars, because if we sell it to someone for five hundred dollars, we know in six months, a year, two years, we're going to be dealing with this thing again. And it's just going to it's just going to be an endless loop. So once mm -hmm. it gets into our hands. There's only one place it goes, and that's the garbage, unless it's like something real nice. But those ones, we know who the owners are, right? Uh, they, they, yeah. keep their, they keep their stuff up to date. So, you know, once it kind of hits that level, you know, th there's, a, there's kind of a crux on, on kind of the value side. But uh, just encourage, encourage them about the benefits of, uh, of having it in the system for all kinds of reasons. Like if it gets lost or stolen, they'll be able to recover it. If it, if, you know, all, all of those kinds of things. And We'll try and work on the getting the enforcement side out there so people are out there checking. So there's a little bit of fear about driving around with a BC number or a 13K number that's not up to date with your <laughs> name on it. Yeah, it's it's yeah. it's it's a you know a multi-phase approach, but I think the biggest thing is is uh, they need to see it as a benefit, and the benefit is, you know, it it shows us that it's yours, and if there is anything that ever happens, we can find you. Otherwise, you know, we might not find you again. All right. Well, I'll put the sell out there to them all because it's starting to pick up the busy season. And yeah, uh, yeah. I, I look at all my survey reports and just the register. Put a registry number down, but you can't find any other information on that. Yeah. So uh, I hear yeah. you. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm I'll, in the same boat. Uh, pardon the pun, <laughs> but yeah, our program is in the same boat. Yeah. Ryan, yeah, definitely out here, out here to help you guys and make sure that everything works. So yeah, free. 
feel free to contact me anytime if you need it, if you need any help or anything out here in the Kootenays. That's great. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Ryan. Um, uh, fantastic. Um, are you happy to take email questions if people have got anything further they want to ask? Yeah, you, you bet. I, I can't find the chat button right now, but as soon oh, as I think okay. I stop sharing, uh, right. it will come back. And so I'll put my email into the chat yeah, and I'll put okay. Sean's email in as well. Oh, fantastic. Uh, <laughs> just because I'm going to punish him for not showing up. Absolutely. <laughs> he deserves punishing. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ryan. Much oh, thank you guys very much, and I hope you have a, a, a really good uh, rest of your conference here. Thank you, and if you could stop your share, I'd be very grateful. Thanks very yeah. much.